morning, CUL, how y'all doing? Would y'all stand with us and worship?
glory floods the earth, fills the skies. Almighty God, there's no one like you. And mountains tremble when you speak. Oh, I'm listening. Whisper changes everything. No one like you, Almighty God. There's no one like you. You are the Lord, forever lifted high. You are the Lord, compassionate and kind. You are the Lord, and we sing. Oh, let the nation 
let's just wait on him this morning. There's nothing impossible for our God this morning. Whatever you're believing for, there is nothing impossible. There's no sickness that he can't heal. The Bible says that by his stripes, we are healed. It's already done. It's already done. All you got to do is believe. Come on, lift your hands, lift your voice. Yeah, there's nothing impossible for you this morning, God. We thank you for healing. We thank you for breakthrough. We thank you for miracles, God. for our prayer partners to come and we're just going to open the altar this morning whatever you're believing for come on up and we'll pray together and we believe together amen yes god we worship you we thank you for healing in this room we thank you for what you're doing in this place god and we just wait on you this morning yes jesus yeah. nothing's impossible for you this morning jesus Let's wait upon the Lord. He will renew our strength. If we just wait upon the Lord, He will renew. Sing it out this morning. Come on, let's wait upon the Lord. You renew our strength. If we just wait, if we just wait upon the Lord, you renew. testimony um, because I think it's 
I, I don't think I know that it is, a, it is a prophetic vision of what is coming to your house. So if you'll just write this down, if you've got somewhere, you can put it on your, it's coming to your house. It's coming to your business. It's coming to your family. It's coming to this local house. And many of the churches in this region in Texas, and it's coming to the nation. Now, we have been handpicked by God, not because we're perfect or not because we're the biggest church, because God knows we're not. But for some reason, somehow, he has picked a lot of the women in this church to be a part of a movement of prayer across America. And that is no small thing. That is no small thing. He picked Bethlehem. He picked Nazareth. They wouldn't have been the places that that the, the crowd would have picked. They weren't the Jerusalem, but he picked Bethlehem. He picked Nazareth. Two days after my wreck, y'all know that a couple of weeks, two and a half, a little over two and a half weeks ago, I had a wreck. It was a Tuesday. I was supposed to fly out on Wednesday to go to Orange County for our Her Voice event in California. I was coming down 225, and I, for two miles ahead, I could see the traffic. It was all across all across the highways, all of the lanes were stopped. And so I started slowing down two, two and a half miles ahead. I saw it. And I was preparing. And I always, when I, I try to leave, Bob will tell you, I'm a little bit of a weirdo. I'm not the best driver in the world, but I am really good about keeping two and a half car distances between me and the person ahead of me. So I began to slow down, and I was almost to a complete stop when I felt something impact my car My car began to spin out of control. I heard the Lord say, you will rise. To be honest, I didn't know if it meant I am getting ready to go to heaven or I will rise out of here a miracle. I knew it meant one or the other. And to be honest, I wasn't scared at that moment. I wasn't. I I just, there was peace. The car was spinning. I blacked out. I remembered things and spoke out to the EMT. Once they pulled me out of the car, I began to spit off what I thought had happened. Uh, Later, we get the the police report, and it was exactly to the literal, to the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T, my remembrance was just right on tact, which is to me is amazing. Uh, the car was a mangled mess. The only thing that was really intact was my seat. And the EMT said, I don't know how you climbed out of this alive. We get to the first hospital, and I won't name the hospital, but it was a joke. They, they bring me into the uh, emergency room, and they haven't run the first test on me, but because my heartbeat was stable and I could breathe, they threw me into the waiting room with a mask on, and I have got four broke ribs and a couple of breaks in my back and uh, trauma to my heart, my aorta. There's, there's um, trauma there. They don't know one thing that's wrong with me, and they throw me, and I ask a couple of people around me, and they've been waiting 16 and 24 hours. I begin to have the the sense to realize that if I stay there, I may not not die. I may die because who knows what's wrong with me. So I begin to call Pastor Bob, Pastor Cindy, and said, get me out of here. They took me to patient's emergency in Galveston. They ran CT scans and found that I had four broke ribs, I had um, uh, trauma here, and then I had some places in my back that were broke, uh, cracked. And he said, believe it or not, Pastor Callie, I think this will heal. But you need to go on and go to UTMB, which is a trauma state. It was the closest trauma hospital, and let them do some more tests. 
So I get home, and two days after getting home, <clears throat> I'm in tremendous pain. Uh, I'm taking meds every three to four hours, and I'm, I'm not thinking straight when you're in that kind of pain. But the second night I go to bed, and I'm waking up every two and a half hours, and I wake up, and I look at the clock, and it's, well, first of all, I wake up, and I jump out of the recliner. For the first six days, I can barely move, but the, the, the dream was so poignant and so powerful that I, I jumped out of my recliner, and Bob goes, what are you doing? And I go, he goes, you don't need to be moving that fast. And he, I go, honey, I just had a dream from God, and I, I need to go to the living room, and I need to sort this dream out. So I went to the living room, looked at my clock, and Jenny Donnelly had just texted me. It was midnight, their time, tw- to our time. And I said, Jenny, I had a dream. I know it was from God. Will you help me? I think I know what parts of this mean. Will you help me decipher this? Now, I want you to know that this dream is for you. This dream is not just for me. This dream is not just for my children. This dream is for us. So here was the dream. The whole family went to the Teton Mountains. And we had flown in there from everywhere, and we had rented some, some uh, vehicles, some, what do you call it, Sport, uh, utility vehicles, um, SUVs. We had gotten there late the night before, and my older kids had played games until like 2 o'clock in the morning, and they went to sleep. All the grandbabies woke up at about 6 and started running around all over the house. So I got up, and I thought, well, I will entertain these kids so these parents can sleep a little longer. And I thought, well, why don't I just take them outside? Because the nature and the mountains, I said, hey, kids, let's go outside. So we're all barefooted. Now, I want you to take note of we were barefooted. And we step outside, and as we step outside, it's very cool. And it's not cold like freezing, but it's cool. It's, it's windy and cool. And so I said, let's get into the SUV. And so I stepped back into the house, pick up the keys to the SUV, and 14, take note of the word 14 or the number 14, we jump into, 14 of us jump into this vehicle. Now, these are all my grandchildren. And we are looking at the beauty around us. And we're in awe, and I'm pointing things out, and, you know, I've got everything from toddlers up to teenagers, and we're all piled in there, and we're looking at things, and all of a sudden, I see a mountain, and I see the top of the mountain, and the rock is shaking at the very top of the mountain. And I said, kids, look at that rock, and they're watching it shake, and I said, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. And then all of a sudden, that rock falls off and begins to run down that mountain, and it lands six to seven feet from my vehicle, and it burrows a hole in the earth, and fire comes up. And I'm not scared in the dream. One of the things they tell you is, how do you feel in a dream? I'm not scared. I'm in awe. I've just seen the very pinnacle of a mountain a rock fall into the ground six feet from my vehicle. So I'm in awe of what's happened. All of a sudden, one of the grandkids say, look, Mima, and I look back up, and the second rock is shaking. The one that was the second rock is now the first rock on top, and it's shaking, and it begins to plummet down the mountain, and it falls into the same hole, and the fire comes up again. And I go, oh, my Lord, it's happened again. And, and I look at the kids and I say, you know what? It might be best for us to go back into the lodge. So I opened up the door and they begin to bound out of the SUV and run into the, to the lodge. But Catherine Grace, take no, note of her name. Before she walks in, she walks up to the edge of the hole and she puts her feet right there at the edge and it burns her little feet and she cries and I pick her up and I run inside 
and we're all in the house, and I run into my son, oldest son, by the name of John Wesley, John Westcott, and I say, Wes, you're not going to believe what I just saw or what you, me and the kids just witnessed. And so we opened the window, and we, they had looked at the mountain the day before, and he was like, Mother. And he grabs my shoulders, and he said, You live to see it. You live to see it. And I woke up. Well, I knew the mountain and the top of the mountain represents the glory of the Lord. That's where Moses went to get to commune with God and to get the tabernacle instructions and to get the commandments. And that's where he came back down and his face shone. So I knew that the mountain was a representation of the glory. And I had a deep suspicion that that rock was the glory hitting the earth. And, and I didn't understand the second rock, but to see something twice means you will live to be a witness. The 14 children was a representation of my legacy and my children and my spiritual children and everything that feels like family to me. They will see what we have been contending for and they will feel the fire under their feet. I walk into the house, and the first child that I see is John Wesley, John Westcott. West means land of the West. And God said, Kelly, I know the enemy tried to take you out. I know he had an assignment to kill you and to stop the assignment that's on this church and on Mothers of Zion and on her voice. He had an assignment. He wanted to stop God from accomplishing. He wanted to shut your mouth, but no weapon formed against you will live to see what you've been praying for. And your children will be affected and your influence will be the legacy that is feels the burning purity fire of the Holy Ghost will affect them. And it will come to the land of West, which America is the West. I have a burden. I've always had a burden for America. So that much of the dream came that night. I took note later that we were all barefooted. The Bible says that God instructed Moses to take off his shoes. We are on holy ground. The number 14, I talked to Jessica Robbins. She goes, Callie, the number 14 is significant. 10 is a completion of a cycle. 4 is dominion. God is saying what has been done in America and in the lives of the people and the, the, the problems, it is over and God is taking you to a place, you, celebration of life, your families to a place of great uh, power and dominion. You're not going to be the underdog trying to survive, but you're going to a place of dominion because you are going to wrap yourself in the kabod of God. The glory of the Lord is descending on your life and he is increasing humility and he is increasing his love and his glory is going to fight and all you're going to have to do is commune. The glory of the Lord. Catherine Grace, Catherine means fire and purity. Grace means favor, mercy, redemption. So God was saying this is going to be a move of fire and purity. It's going to be a move of grace and redemption. (laughs) 
And this is funny. Last night I was sitting around and I was recalling this dream and thinking about it. And the Lord said, <laughs> look up Teton. And I said, okay, I had looked up Teton. And Teton means two big women's breast. It just isn't that hysterical? Her voice. I mean, he can't, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I'm like, I looked at Bob and I said, Teton means breast. And he starts hysterically laughing. And I'm like, her voice. Her voice. Now, I told all of you to say this. God not only saved my life, but he saved yours. And it may not have been in the last two weeks. Maybe it was two years ago when you faced something that would have destroyed somebody else. Maybe it was six years ago. Maybe it was a completely different type of scenario than Pastor Kelly's. But you're still here today. You've been delivered and you've been redeemed. Maybe it was losing your, your wife of almost 40 years. You're still here, Bob. Everybody thought you wouldn't make it. You'd be down for the count. And you would have if it hadn't been for Jesus. It was Jesus that saved you. It was Jesus that strengthened your faith. How many of you know that God saved you in the last 10 years of something? What would have destroyed you, God, you just set your face like a flint toward Jesus, and God rescued you. We're going to talk about Pentecost, and we're going to talk about the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But there's one verse in this whole chapter as Pastor Bob begins to teach. Do you want me to read the chapter first? I'm going to read the chapter, and then he's going to teach. But I, I'm telling you something. The glory of the Lord has already started to descend on this house and to descend on your home. That's why you're here. You've been handpicked by God. But we have got to be filled with the Spirit. I want you to write, filled with the Spirit. We have got to desire that communion and the life of Jesus. See, in that communion is where we find life. We have got to desire that above everything else in our life. And the only way to grow in that desire is to be filled with the Spirit and to just begin to do it. You have to work with the Holy Spirit, and you, you need to begin to do it. So I'm going to read this chapter, and then Pastor Bob's going to teach, and we'll go back to some points later. Uh, I'm going to read it on my phone because I can read it better. I'm reading Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And if you want to get your Bibles, and, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. And on the day of Pentecost, and on the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled. All the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house. And as Pastor Bob said today, wind and the Spirit are the same here. Rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overwhelming, it was all everyone could hear. Then all at once, a pillar, pillar of fire, and I want you to underline pillar of fire. Notice that there was fire in my dream. A pillar of fire appeared before your eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit, to speak in languages they had never learned. So they're speaking in languages in tongues that they had never learned. Now at that time, there were Jewish worshipers who had immigrated from many different lands to live in Jerusalem. 
When the people of the city heard the roaring sound, crowds came running to where it was coming from, stunned over what was happening because each one could hear the disciples speaking in his or her own language. Bewildered, they said to one another, aren't these all Galileans? In other words, aren't these all Texans? How are they speaking French? So how is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages? We are Northwestern Iranians, Northwestern Iranians, uh, Elamites, and from from Mesopotamia, Judea, and they go on and on and on to talk about where they're from, and there's a bunch of things said here of where they're from. Yet we hear them speaking of God's uh, mighty wonders in our own dialects. They, will, uh, they all stood there, dumbfounded and astonished, saying one another, what is this phenomenon? These people are Galileans, and they're speaking our languages, and they're speaking about the wonders and power of God. But others poked fun at them and said, they're just drunk on that new wine. They're, dr- they're drinking. They're drunk. Peter Stands up, it said, Peter stood with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, my fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, you need to clearly understand what's happening here. These people are not drunk like you think they are, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel, for God says, and now he, now he gives the prophecy, this is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and your daughters to prophesy and your young men to see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all my servants and men and women alike and they will prophesy. I will um, reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of clouds will appear for the sun will be turned dark and the moon blood red before the great and awesome appearance of the day of the Lord. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 22, Peter continued, people of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus, the victorious, was the man on a, was a man on a divine mission? Am I running? Sorry about that. It's just it's it's, it's not worthy stuff. <laughs> Peter continued. People of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus, the victorious, was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven, for you know how God performed many miracles, signs, and wonders through him. This man, this man's destiny was prearranged. He's explaining things to him. For God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet it was all part of his predestined plan. God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him a prisoner. This is the very thing David prophesied about. And now it gives David's prophecy. I continually see the Lord in front of me. He is at my right hand and I am never shaken. No wonder my heart is glad and my glory celebrates. My mouth is filled with praises and I have hope that my body will live because you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor will you allow your sacred one to experience decay. For you have revealed to me the pathways to life and seeing your face fills me with euphoria. My fellow Jews, I can tell you that this is There is no doubt that our noted patriarch has both died and been buried in his tomb, which remains to this day. So you can see that he was not referring to himself with those words. But as a prophet, he knew God's faithful promise made with God's unbreakable oath that one of his descendants would take his throne. 
So when peering into the future, David prophesied of the Messiah's resurrection, and God revealed to him that the Messiah would be would be abandoned to the realm of death, nor would not would, yes would be abandoned to the realm of of or of death, nor would his body experience decay. Can't you see it? God has resurrected Jesus, and will have and we all have seen him. Then God exalted him to his right hand upon the throne of the highest honor, and the Father gave his authority to send the promised Holy Spirit. This is what we have, y'all. We have the promised Holy Spirit, which is being poured out upon us today. This is what you're seeing and hearing. David wasn't the one who ascended into heaven, but the one who prophesied. Yahweh said to my Lord, I honor you by enthroning you beside me until I make your enemies a footstool beneath your feet. Now everyone in Israel can know for certain that Jesus whom you crucified is the one God has made both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were crushed and realized what they had done to Jesus. Deeply moved, they said to Peter and the other apostles, What do we need to do? Brothers, what do we need to do? Peter replied to them, repent, turn to God, and each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed. Then you may take hold of the holy take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your families and for the, those that are to be born and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter preached to them and warned them with these words, be rescued from the wayward and perverse culture of the word. Those who believe the word that day numbered 3,000. They were all baptized and added to the church, 3,000 of them. Now, I want to make this clear. When Jesus died, the disciples were destroyed emotionally because in their mind, they thought Jesus was going to be another prophet, another judge that was going to bring Israel out of the control of Rome. They thought we we're being saved again, and they were being saved, but this time they were, he was bringing an eternal kingdom, and they did not have that perspective. Then Jesus died, and he rose again. When he rose again, they began to understand that, oh, he came to die. This is not just about us being free from Rome. This is about an eternal kingdom. He is freeing mankind from sin. And then he spent 40 days walking around on the earth, repairing these men's perspective. Because like Pastor Bob said to me this morning, he was getting ready to kick the ball to them. And they had to understand that everything that had just happened in the last 40 days was providential and by the hand of God. And I'm going to let Bob take it from here. All right, I'm going <laughs> to try to wrap this up. <laughs> I know, I can see the sound going. All right. Um, significance of Pentecost. God you, works in times and seasons. And many things that happen in significance is one of, the, one of the feast days. So it's not unusual for it to happen. Today is one of those days. So... There's no telling what could happen today. So uh, we expect great things. But the first uh, significant time that we can remember, the Shavuot is called. It was counting the 50 days after Passover. 49 days and the 50th day is Shavuot, which would, they would bring their grain offering, the second one. The first one is, was the probably a barley the second one was the wheat, and they would bring the loaves instead of the barley. They would actually cook bread and wave two pieces of bread. All that has significance. I'm not sure I've got time to go into it. But Moses received the Ten Commandments on the mountain on that holiday. 
what we call Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek word for 50 days. So whether you call it Pentecost or Shavuot, whatever you call it, it's the same day. And then so significantly, Jesus died on Passover when the Passover lamb, during the time the Passover lamb is being sacrificed for the children of Israel, Jesus is dying for the, for the sins of the world. And then they counted 50 days, and afterwards, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. So it's, God likes to work in those seasons and cycles, and you can see uh, significance in all of that if you start looking at it real closely. But we want to stay with the bigger, big picture, which is Jesus had been uh, giving his disciples authority and telling them, go out and now do it. You've watched me do it. Now you do it. I'm giving you the authority and the power to do it. And, but then he said, I'm going away, which was very concerning to them. Because, you know, how are we going to do things in your name and your power if you're not here? He said, it's good that I'm going to go away because I'm going to send another comforter just like myself. The word there is just like me. And he's going to be with you, and he's going to live in you. So now the concept of the Jews' concept of God being with them was that he was living in the temple. And they knew that because during the desert time, there was a cloud by day and a fire by night. And the priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And if he didn't go in there correctly, he would die. So they knew the presence of God was with them, and they would follow the, the, the fire and the cloud. And so they associated the fire of God with the Spirit of God. And that day, he's saying, uh, not only is, am I going to come live with you, I'm going to come live in you. So each one of you, the, the fire of God came in that room and dwelt with each person. And now they had the authority and the power living in them, not just walking around them. So now that Jesus was limited physically to being one place at one time, and now the Holy Spirit's not limited and he's in everyone that's a believer. And so in that way, we, we, do, we can do greater works. That's one of the ways we can do greater works. So now you have the power and the Spirit of God living within you. And that day was the day that the church was birthed in the power of the fire of the Holy Spirit. We can talk about the wind. We can talk about the fire. But the important part was what happened when that happened. He said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to fill you. He's going to come upon you. You're going to be baptized. The word baptized, the the best definition I heard is we, we used to do tie-dye shirts a long time ago. And so we learned about dyeing. And you would, you would uh, put some dye in the water, and you would, you would tie the shirt up different knots if you wanted it to be different designs. And you'd let it soak in the water for a good long time, and then you would take it out and wring it out, and then you would dry it out, and it would come out with designs. Well, you had to give it time to soak into the fabric. And that's what the word baptized meant. It meant that you were drenched, soaked, absorbed, and it became, you saturated you. So when he said, I'm going to baptize you, it wasn't the thinking, I'm just going to dip you in the water and you're out. It was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to saturate you with the Holy Spirit. And so this, it's much more than just coming on you. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on people to do things. And in the New Testament, he would live in us to do things. And he still comes on us and in us. He does, he does it both. But the, the saturation of the Holy Spirit. And the, so the interesting thing is that the result was they began praising God, and it came out in supernatural languages, and they were prophesying, and they were speaking of the wonders of God, and it got the attention of the people. And why was there people around? It's because it was Shavuot, Shavuot. And they were all there to bring their offerings that was required of them to come for those different feasts to come to the temple. And that was one of them. So there was a lot of people around, and they heard the noise, and they heard the commotion, and they heard these people praising God, and they got their attention. And that you see in the book of Acts, this continually happens. The supernatural works of God got people's attention, and then the gospel was preached. And then the people's hearts were opened, and people got saved. So we still need that same thing today. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to saturate you with him so that you can have power to become my witnesses. So we need that today just as much as they did then. And the Holy Spirit came. That was the beginning, but it's not the end. He said, as, as she read this same uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses 38, uh, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and your children and for everyone after that. That's us. He said, so this promise is not just for certain people to have a gift. It's for all of us to receive the fullness of the Spirit. And some people say, well, I've got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you, you have the Holy Spirit when you get saved. He come, your spirit is reborn and reconnected to God, and the Spirit of God does come to live inside of you, and I'm not going to knock that. But there's more. God, God wants you to get the most you can get. So the Holy Spirit wants to have all of you. You might have said yes to Jesus, but you didn't know what your yes meant. And then the yes means I want all of you. I want, your, I want what you say. I want what you do. I want your relationships. I want, I want you to involve me in everything, your money everything. And so we, there's, a, there's a point of surrendering to the Holy Spirit and saying, ah, whatever you want to do, I'll do. And just fill me with the power to do it. I can't do it without the Holy Spirit. I can do lots of things, but it won't have any inter- eternal kingdom impact without the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit, just like they did. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you this so you can be witnesses. And um, so the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we need the fullness. There's, uh, and in Ephesians 5, 18, it says, do not be drunk with wine, or as some people do, get, they're, they're drunk. Be drunk means that you're completely inebriated, completely uh, saturated with alcohol to the point where you've lost your senses and unable to function normally. And he says, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word there in the Greek is be continually being filled. So that means that we don't just have one experience where, yeah, we felt good, felt some goosebumps, the Holy Spirit, where our, our mouth was trembling a little bit, and we're done. From now on, I just don't have to mess with that anymore. That's not the way it works. It says, be continually being filled. That means we have to continually be surrendering more and more of our life to the Lord to use any way he wants. And who's the person who's working with you directly, constantly? It's the Holy Spirit. He said, I've sent you another comforter like myself. He's going to bring to your remembrance everything I've taught you. He's going to be your comforter, your counselor, your guide. The word there is got a lot of meanings, but it's the, the, the way I like to use the connection for me is like a coach who's it's a life coach constantly beside you, coaching you, telling you what to do. And if you were in courtroom, it would be your counselor. But he's, he's there counseling. He's comforting you. He's coaching you. He's directing you. And that's what he wants to be. But we choose how much we're going to let him do that. It's our choice. So the first step that many of us have ever experienced of surrendering to the Holy Spirit is when we say, I want to, I want to be uh, submerged into the Holy Spirit to the point where I, I, can, uh, I get that supernatural language that I can pray. And, uh, and according to Romans 8, when we pray that supernatural language, it prays, he, the Holy Spirit prays through us the perfect will of God for us. And so we want to be able to pray the perfect will of God. We don't always know what to pray. And sometimes it's just moaning, the Romans 8 says, but he says that the Holy Spirit comes and gives us the spirit of adoption, first of all, that we accept that we are sons and daughters of God, accepted in the family, and that he prays the perfect will of God through us. So we need the Holy Spirit for so many reasons. We need not just a little bit, a lot. <laughs> so we want the maximum we can get. And it's the maximum surrender you can give. So it's like he says, okay, the first thing I want is your mouth. Because our mouth, James talks about the power of our words and what we say and the power of the tongue. You know, it can, it can destroy things. It can build things. It can be like a rudder that leads our life and directs us. And we can curse our own self with our mouth. And so the first thing the Holy Spirit would like to get a hold of is your mouth. And say, I surrender my mouth to you. And what it, the Holy Spirit does not come and take over our mouth and speak for us. So that'd be great sometimes because it'd keep us from getting in trouble. But <laughs> he gives us a choice to say, don't say that, say this, right? And instead, he's whispering in your ear. But so the first initial experience you have is that you go to the, you say, I want the fullness, I want the baptism, I want to be saturated with the Holy Spirit. And what the first thing is, You start praying, thanking God, using your mouth, yourself, and then the Holy Spirit, you say, I'll give you my, I'll give you my mouth. You can speak through me. And you'll, he will give you another prayer language that doesn't sound like English to you, 
And it can be another language, or it can be a heavenly language. There's heavenly languages and there's earthly languages. It doesn't matter. The point is you don't, you're not doing it. The Holy Spirit begins using your mouth. But you are using your mouth too. You're speaking. Because I've, I've tried to pray for people. I'm trying to give you a few tips on how to receive. I pray for people who their mouth is shut. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's not going to open your mouth for you. It's like saying, Holy Spirit, teach me to play the piano, and then sitting there and saying, well, nothing's happening. <laughs> if, if it was God, there should be the, I, my fingers should be just going all over the place. No, he's not going to move your hand for you. You get out there and you practice, and then he anoints that, and then it, you can do more than you can normally can do. It's the same way with uh, you know, speaking in a supernatural language. You know, we say tongues. Tongue just means language. See, speaking in a supernatural language, you begin worshiping the Lord. This is what they were doing in the upper room. They weren't just sitting there. They were in unity in one accord, and they were thinking and worshiping God, and the next thing you know, the Spirit comes on them, and they're speaking in new languages. I'm sure that they were not, they had never experienced the Holy Spirit before. There was nobody there to coach them. So they just began naturally speaking another language without being prompted, without being told what to say, but I guarantee you their mouths were moving. So they were thanking God, praising God, and the next thing you know, it comes out in another language. So I'm telling you, it's, it's a combination of you work with the Holy Spirit. He's not going to force you. That's what evil spirits do. Evil spirits, they manipulate, push, force, and the Holy Spirit draws and pulls and woos you to do what he wants you to do, and you have to cooperate. So you just say, Lord, have all of me. Have my mouth. And I'm going to start worshiping the Lord, and then it's going to happen naturally. You know, and people laid hands. We see in the book of Acts later on, people come and lay hands on other believers. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? No, we haven't. Well, here you go. And they laid hands on They would pray for them. They would have the same experience. We see the book of Acts that Cornelius is a Gentile. He's not a Jew. And God tells... Um, Peter, to go to the house of a, a Gentile, which he didn't want to do. God had to teach him that it's, if I say it's okay, it's okay. So he went there, and the same thing happened to these people that happened to them. The Holy Spirit came on them, and he said, look, the same thing's happening. So that means God must be okay with giving his spirit to the Gentiles too. You know, so if you need some convincing, just do a study on the Holy Spirit, and recognize that it's for today, it's for you, it's for everybody here. There's nobody that's more special that can have it and not have it. Everyone can have it. And it happens the same way as it did then, where the Holy Spirit comes upon you, but that's not the end. That's just the beginning. This is the you know elementary school. We learn to give our voice to the Holy Spirit. He prays through us. <clears throat> we learn to submit to the Holy Spirit in other parts of our lives. You know, we say, okay, I've got my prayer language now. I can pray in the Spirit. That's great. I'm glad you did that. But that's not the end. You just had an experience, yes. But now he wants to say, I want you to let me restrain some of your other things you're doing. Let me in. Let me involved in your relationships and your actions and your reactions and in your investments and in your money. You know, that might be a little harder for some of you. But it starts... With the mouth, because the mouth is so important. And sometimes we grab back control. That's why we need to continually be filled, continually be surrendered, and be submerged again and immersed in the Holy Spirit because we continually want to go back to our ways without, until we get used to the surrendered life, the sacrificed life. And I mean, I had plenty of other things to say, but the Holy Spirit is not a gift. He's not a wind. He's not a fire. He's a person. He's the, he's the third person of the Trinity. He is God. He's God. Jesus is God. The Father's God. They're three in one. Can't explain it. Just believe it. But the Holy Spirit is God. So he's to be honored just as we honor Jesus and the Father. He always points to the Father and Jesus, and Jesus always points to the Father. That's, that's what they, the role that they play. They're completely one. I don't understand it. But I'm saying that he's a person. So that means when we get to work in this relationship, like I said, it's, it's a uh, working together relationship, that we have to learn to honor the Holy Spirit as God. 
when when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something and you don't do it, there's no difference between disobeying a commandment in the Bible that says do not steal, and the Holy Spirit says don't do that, and you do, and you still do it. You're committing, you're sinning against the Lord just as if it was a commandment in the Ten Commandments, right? So getting to know the Holy Spirit, He works with you. He's very patient with you. He counsels you. He gives you advice. He doesn't sh- shove you into something. He he draws you and pulls you, and he'll let you make the wrong choice. But you'll notice that when you do, that you don't feel his presence the way you did the moment before. When you begin saying no and disobeying and rebelling, there's a, it becomes a more of a distant feeling. Does God leave you? No. Is your, but your intimate fellowship is not the same. Until you go back and repent and say, you know what? I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I repent. Please forgive me. Put it under the blood. And your, your uh, intimate relationship is back stored. So, yeah, everything's not about just cutting dry, like, okay, I'm forgiven, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, that's all I need to know. It's, it's about a constant working relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's going to reveal to us God. He's going to magnify God in our lives. He's going to direct us. But we have to surrender.